Thank you for tuning in to Halton News. It's Monday, March 30th, and I'm Jessica Kading. The total number of confirmed COVID-19 cases reported by the Halton region is now 36. The vast majority of those infected are currently at home isolating. Two are in hospital, including a female in her 20s and a woman in her 30s. An Oakville firefighter has tested positive, as well as a member of the Halton Regional Police, though this was not a public-facing member. Additionally, there are 18 cases with preliminary positive results awaiting confirmation. Of course, the total number of actual cases in Halton is unknown, as only those with severe symptoms or those meeting certain criteria are currently being tested. The criteria for testing includes having symptoms and one of the following, being over the age of 60 or having a pre-existing medical condition, those who have been in contact with a confirmed case of COVID-19, or those working in a healthcare or long-term setting and showing symptoms, First Nation community members living on reserve, and anyone specifically directed by Halton Region Public Health can also be tested. Anyone who does meet the above criteria and wants to be tested must call 311 ahead of time to schedule an appointment. If you have symptoms but do not meet the above criteria, you can still call 311 for assessment and advice. Anyone with symptoms needs to self-isolate for 14 days or until you've been symptom-free for 24 hours. Those with severe symptoms are advised to call 911. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau addressed the country this morning, providing more details about the Canada wage subsidy that was announced for businesses and their employees last week. We know that the significant part of uh, business expenses are around payroll, and our focus is right now on supporting workers, supporting Canadians so they can stay home, so they can make sure we're doing the things we knew, need to get through this uh, as quickly and as well as we possibly can. Uh, our focus right now is on this wage subsidy we're, uh, of 75% uh, for employers who need it. Uh, that'll give uh, Canadian workers uh, up to $847 a week, depending on uh, what their salary is. Uh, these are measures that will make a huge difference in relief for businesses, uh, in uh, relief for workers, in ensuring our capacity to bounce back, to rush back strongly when this is all through. That is our focus right now. But as I've said, these are measures we're doing now, uh, we are always going to look at, are there more things we need to do? Are there other ways that we can and must help people get through this difficult time? Uh, we will continue to listen and work with people uh, to make sure that we're able to come through this as strongly as possible and get out the other side as strongly as possible. For those that have lost their job due to COVID-19, the federal government also announced an emergency relief fund that will be available for all affected, whether you qualify for EI or not. I spoke with MP Karina Gould today for more information about that fund, as well as some clarification as to the Canadian Army preparing to help during the COVID-19 crisis and what that really means. MP Karina Gould, thank you for joining us again today. We wanted to connect to talk about how the Canadian military has been put on standby to basically be ready and able to deploy if and when the Canadian government needs them for COVID-19 measures. Um, could you speak to what exactly they'd be used for? Yeah, so it's an excellent question because really what General Vance has been asking the military to do is to be even more prepared for when we come into natural disaster season, right? So the spring, we often see flooding. Sometimes it's the start of the fire season. And while we call on the military, we also do it in conjunction with the Red Cross. But we understand that the Red Cross and other voluntary organizations are going to be at capacity with regards to COVID. And so really, it's about asking the military to maybe step up a little bit more in other areas. So primarily with regards to the flooding season, for example. Okay, so not necessarily um, enforcing quarantine measures. Okay. No, not, not at this point, no. Okay. Um, no. And we also wanted to talk about the emergency relief fund. And it was announced last Wednesday that it would be coming. Now, this would apply to people whether they qualify for EI or whether they don't. Um, yeah. So for those who do qualify, are they supposed to wait for this fund or should they go ahead and apply with EI? So if you qualify for EI, you can absolutely go ahead and continue to apply for EI and you'll be rolled into this new fund. You do not have to wait. For those who do not qualify for EI, uh, the portal should be up uh, in the coming 
days. Uh, my, if you're interested in it, please don't hesitate to reach out to my office. We're keeping track of everyone who's interested and we'll let you know as soon as it's up and running. Um, and it has replaced the previous two benefits that we announced a couple of weeks ago now, uh, just into one, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. And this will be uh, $500 um, on a weekly basis, $2,000 a month for a period of up to 16 months, uh, 16 weeks, sorry. And it will be a uh, retroactive as of March 15th. Now this hasn't come out yet so anyone who's had any notification saying that the government is reaching them about this is probably being scammed is that right? Completely. We are so uh, disappointed to see that scammers are trying to take advantage of this, you know, uh, extraordinary and unprecedented time and really preying on people's vulnerability. And so if you've gotten a text message or an email or a call saying that the government is going to deposit money into your account and to send them your account information, that is absolutely a scam. The government will not be asking for that information. Um, but again, if you have any questions, please call my office, 905-639-5757. It's always best to check first, and we can tell you, uh, you know, what, what it is that the government is planning on doing. But if you've received information about the CERB right now, um, it's it's probably, it's it's most likely a scam because that website is not live and that benefit is not quite ready to be rolled out yet. Okay, thank you for clearing that up. And also we wanted to talk about some of the good news that has been going on lately with um, Kids Help Phone, for example. Yeah, absolutely. So on Sunday, the Prime Minister announced additional funding for the Kids Help Phone and for seniors through the United Way. And one of the reasons why we've, we're have supporting these two organizations is because we understand for young people, this can be a really stressful time. I mean, you're not going to school, perhaps things are already tense in your household. And if you need someone to talk to, uh, you can reach out to the Kids Help Phone. We've provided additional financial resources for them so that they can have more people available, more counselors to talk to to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So please reach out if you if you need assistance or you just need someone to talk to. And we provided additional funding through the United Way to make sure that we're supporting our seniors. Um, you know, whether this is shopping for groceries or having someone to talk to, uh, United Ways throughout Canada are going to be working with their partner organizations, including right here in Halton, to make sure that uh, our seniors have the support that they need uh, during um, during this this time of COVID-19. Well, thank you so much. And thanks for all that you've been doing. I know that you're incredibly busy and we really appreciate your time today and we hope to have you back on soon. Thank you, Jessica. And thanks for uh, the great work that Cogeco is doing providing information to our community. On Saturday, the government of Ontario issued an emergency order to prohibit gatherings of more than five people. This replaces the previous order, which only restricted gatherings of over 50. This new limit of five does not apply to private households of more than five people. Child care centres taking care of first-line responders and children are also allowed to continue to operate as long as they do not exceed 50 people. Funerals are limited to a maximum of 10 people at any one time. By law, those returning from travel must self-isolate for 14 days. Despite these announcements, Premier Doug Ford addressed Ontarians today and said that the number of people seen out together over the weekend was unacceptable. From what I saw and what my colleagues saw, the streets were packed and that's unacceptable. We need every person in this province to take a hard look at their habits. Because as I've always said, every option is on the table and we're prepared to take further action if we do not see the spread of this virus slow down in the coming days. My heart breaks when I see what's happening around the world. As the death toll from this virus rises, we must continue to take advice of those impacted. It's easy to turn on the TV and think what's happening in Europe can't happen here but it can happen anywhere. Our story in Ontario can be different than Italy's and Spain's, but only if we all take this seriously. Over the last few days, there's been an increase in outbreaks and deaths in long-term care homes due to COVID-19. Acknowledging this today, Premier Doug Ford announced $243 million will go towards helping protect those most vulnerable. 
This will go towards 24-7 screening of staff and residents for more cleaning and sanitation and to increase capacity and reduce pressure on hospitals. We're investing another $70 million to enable the same screening and cleaning measures in retirement homes, residential facilities, and emergency shelters. We passed an emergency order detected at long-term care homes to limit non-essential visitors, improve COVID-19 screening of staff and volunteers, and ensure that seniors get the right level of care during these uncertain times. Many nonprofit organizations were classified as an essential service and continue to operate during this COVID-19 pandemic. To carry on providing services as they have been though, some like the Burlington Salvation Army are going to need your help now more than ever. Melissa Candelaria reports. It's business as usual for the Burlington Salvation Army as the organization continues to prepare food for local families in need. Executive Director Doug Binner says the Salvation Army Food Bank is an essential service without a doubt. And uh, has been long before COVID ever uh, came into existence. Uh, there are many, many people here in Burlington who struggle with food security on a regular basis and uh, struggle with things like making decisions between paying their rent or, or paying their hydro or putting food on the table for their family. So we've been an essential service for quite some time. We've been in existence here in Burlington for over 50 years already. The challenge now is how to continue servicing their existing clients while preparing for the influx of new ones to come. Binner says since COVID-19 hit, more and more people are going to look to them for help. As they face unemployment, as they await uh, assistance from the government, are going to be coming to food banks and looking for assistance just to feed their families. Every week we're seeing more and more new clients, people who have never been to a food bank before and who have come for the first time. And we need to get a bit of their information, absolutely. We're able to do that over the phone and to, uh, to do our intake process uh, in, a, in a safe way. But we're assisting more and more people and uh, more and more new clients. The Salvation Army has made changes in order to accommodate the increase while keeping their staff and volunteers safe. We've got a great uh, staff and a great uh, team of volunteers. Although we've pared that down and we're only allowing uh, a minimum number of people, uh, volunteers or staff, into our building at a time, uh, we've, we've got a good team in place and uh, we're grateful for that. And we've got a system in place now that allows us to serve one client at a time in a safe manner, keeping the social distancing that, uh, that the health uh, authorities are, are uh, requiring of us and yet still getting that food to needy families. We've also eliminated our 21-day return policy. Our regular clients, many of them come on a regular basis and uh, we've eliminated that and have said to all of our clients, come as often as you need. Uh, we have food available and we want to make sure that your family is well fed. Binner says although they've seen tremendous generosity already, continued donations are going to be vital to keep up critically important that the donations continue to come. Uh, as you can see behind us, uh, our, our shelves are beginning to, to get a little bit bare. And uh, once we move into the, uh, the late spring and summer, we always begin to run short of food. The big donations that would usually come through the grocery stores and through the gift of giving back in, in June and at Easter time are probably not going to be as generous, may not even be able to happen. And so uh, we're, we're really looking for a continuation of uh, those donated products so that we can continue to serve our community. The Salvation Army is also accepting monetary donations, which you can do by dropping it off at the Family Services Building on Mainway or through their website. Reporting for Halton News, I'm Melissa Candelaria. The uncertainty surrounding COVID-19 and how long these social and physical distancing measures will be in place has made it difficult for many organizations to continue planning their summer events. One huge festival that we all look forward to will have to be postponed until 2021. I spoke with the executive director of the Burlington Sound of Music Festival earlier today about the difficult but completely understandable decision. It was a difficult decision, uh, absolutely, and it was made by a very dedicated group of people um, our volunteer team of uh, board of directors, uh, in tandem with the city of Burlington, with local health officials, federal, provincial government, um, you know, it, it just 
came down to looking at everything that's going on with the COVID pandemic and really making sure that we step up and do the responsible thing to help stop the spread of this uh, virus when and where we can. And there's a lot of uncertainty around the, the future and looking at postponing dates. It's, it's hard to say, uh, you know, when things are going to return to normal. So uh, really, we just kind of had to grab the bull by the horns and, and put a hard stop to it all, which uh, I think this is the first time in 41 years this festival has ever been cancelled. So uh, being the executive director who had to make that decision was was not a good, uh, fun discussion to have. But uh, again, I, I have to thank everybody who helped come to the table and get us to this difficult uh, conclusion. The Burlington Sound of Music Festival is working on rebooking the musicians for 2021 and will continue to support the music industry. Information about ticket deferral or refunds will be posted on April 3rd on soundofmusic.ca. They also ask that you follow them on social media for other updates and announcements. Kojiko is a proud sponsor of the Burlington Sound of Music Festival and will continue this commitment in 2021. Additionally, we are in the process of creating a television series in partnership with the Burlington Sound of Music. More details will be provided when available. From our Halton Regional Police today, it was reported that there was a fatal crash in Milton last night. A 34-year-old Windsor man veered off Brawny Street North into a pond south of Seedales Avenue. When police arrived on scene, they found the vehicle, which they now know was stolen, fully submerged. The sole occupant was rushed to hospital, but did not survive. The Halton Regional Police Reconstruction Unit is investigating and ask anyone with information or dash cam footage to call 905-825-4747, extension 5121. We do need to take a short break, but we'll be right back with your local weather forecast after this. Thanks for staying with us here on Halton News. It's Monday, March 30th, and I'm Jessica Kading. We now have your local weather forecast ready for you. It was cloudy but mild today across the region, and some areas of Halton will see rainfall tonight and some more drizzle tomorrow morning. Looking into the week ahead, there is lots of sunshine in our long range forecast. Spring temperatures are here to stay for the week. While some rainfall is likely to fall tomorrow, depending where you are in the region, we are looking at a mix of sun and clouds for the rest of the week and will be reaching double digits by Wednesday. Of course, you're welcome to enjoy these milder temperatures in your backyard, but you're reminded to maintain physical distance from others. Do not gather in parks or use playground equipment. Stocks were climbing back up in the U.S. last week, and that trend continues today. Here's a look at how the markets closed on both sides of the border. Time for another very short break. When we come back, we'll find out how your TV producer Chris Cox is coping with non-essential businesses such as hair cutters being closed. We'll be right back. Thanks for staying with us here on Halton News. It's Monday, March 30th, and I'm Jessica Kading. Our next segment is something many of you can now relate to with non-essential businesses being closed and physical distancing measures advising us to avoid close contact with anyone outside of our home. Many of us are starting to consider do-it-yourself haircuts. Let's see how this experiment pans out for your TV producer, Chris Cox. The other thing is just for a little bit more lightheartedness, there's a little bit of a review of what I did over my weekend. Um, it was a little bit more free form. It was nice having my wife at home because she's been working all week. She works in the hospital system. She has to be there. Um, it's, it's funny, it's the small things that are really um, piling up, I guess, or that are really uh, going to confront you and force us all to sort of get out of our comfort zone and, and figure out the, how we're gonna get these things done. 
but I got, had to ki cut my kid's hair. It was in their face, it's in their ears. Um, so I gave it a shot. And by no means do I think that I will be able to do this on a regular basis. I can't wait to be able to get back to my barbers, Roger and, and Telly, they, they do awesome work. But I gave it a shot on cutting their hair, so maybe let's take a look at that. Okay, during the outbreak, one thing we forgot about was haircuts. All of our haircuts were cancelled, which is fine. We're all supposed to be isolating, and that doesn't stop our hair from growing. And as you can see, his is getting all into his ears and super shaggy. So I'm going to have my first go at cutting my son's hair, and we'll give it a shot. And if I really screw it up, then we're just going to shave your head. I'm not a barber. I'm not a barber. So I could jack this up. Okay? No. I could really screw this up. We'll have a new edition for you tomorrow night at 5.30. For Halton News, I'm Jessica Kading, and I'll see you tomorrow.